I'm Russ Roberts. What I'll be doing in this series is looking at just how easy it is to be fooled by numbers and data and how hard it is to measure economic life accurately. We often have preconceived notions about how the world works, and that makes it hard to look at numbers objectively. We tend to embrace studies or data that confirm our worldview while dismissing or avoiding evidence on the other side. It's good to remember the insight of physicist Richard Feynman. The first principle is you must not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. We're going to start with an important question. How's the American economy been treating the middle class over the last 40 years? Wages and incomes are actually a lot higher now than in the 1970s, but so are prices. What we care about is what those wages can buy. If prices have gone up more than wages, then workers are actually worse off. A worker today, even with higher income, has less purchasing power than a worker in the 1970s if too many things have gotten a lot more expensive. Everyone says the gains from all the economic growth of the last 40 years have gone to the rich. Those in the middle class have been stuck treading water at best, making no progress since the 1970s. Is that true? How do you find out? It should be straightforward to take a measure of wages or income for the middle class or the average worker and correct it for inflation. But it's not straightforward at all. What I want to show you is just how sensitive the results can be to the different assumptions you can make. Let's start with Nobel laureate and New York Times columnist Paul Krugman. Wages for ordinary workers have in fact been stagnant since the 1970s. Here's Krugman's chart to back up his claim. Wages for production and non-supervisory workers. Those workers make up about 80% of the private labor force. That mostly excludes the people at the top. That's good. It excludes the rich and super rich who might distort the average and make it less representative. So this looks like a pretty good snapshot of the average worker. To correct for inflation, the chart uses the CPIU, a price index calculated by the Bureau of Labor Statistics that measures the prices paid by urban consumers. And that's pretty depressing. After taking account of the effects of inflation, the average worker's salary buys 6% less stuff than in 1973. The economy's broken. But what if we'd use the PCE to correct for inflation? A price index often used by the Congressional Budget Office and the Federal Reserve. The PCE is calculated by the Department of Commerce's Bureau of Economic Analysis. It includes both urban and rural consumers and measures the price of healthcare and housing differently from the CPIU. It's also what's called a chained index. It corrects for the fact that when some goods get relatively more expensive, you can substitute toward relatively cheaper goods. Because in real life, you don't keep buying the same combination of goods in the same amount when prices change. Use the PCE on the same data that Krugman used and you get a very different picture. The average worker's standard of living is up 17% over the last 40 years. That's not great, but it's a lot better than worse off by 6%. Maybe the economy isn't totally broken after all. But that's just one kind of data for a subset of the economy. Let's take a different look. Jared Bernstein, writing in the New York Times, used data from the Congressional Budget Office on household income between 1979 and 2010 that corrects for inflation using the PCE. He excludes the bottom 40% and the top 40%. What's left is the middle fifth, the middle quintile, a pretty good snapshot of the middle class. Bernstein takes the average earnings per household in that middle fifth in 2010 and compares it to average earnings per household in the middle fifth in 1979. Bernstein's conclusion is very similar to Krugman's. For middle-income households, earnings have declined in real terms 7% from 1979 to 2010. The economy is broken. 31 years of no progress for the middle class. Bernstein argues that the only things keeping the middle class financially healthy are increases in government spending and tax cuts. Bernstein's numbers are used in the PCE, and he gets the same depressing result as Krugman. But is that the end of the story? Bernstein and Krugman only looked at cash compensation. That leaves out benefits, because benefits have become more important since the 1970s. Leaving them out understates the true standard of living and how much it's grown. The CBO has a broader measure of compensation, what they call labor income, that includes employer contributions to healthcare and some other forms of compensation. 
the picture improves. Growth in labor income is just about zero over this time period, but still negative for the middle quintile. Again, the economy's broken. But wait, it's complicated. Scott Winship, writing in Forbes magazine, notes that Bernstein's measurement of middle-class progress includes elderly households, households headed by someone 65 or older. A disproportionate share of their income comes from retirement benefits or investments. Even if the economy is doing well, you wouldn't expect the earnings of the elderly to grow very much. And in the 31 years between 1979 and 2010, the percentage of households in the middle quintile headed by people over 65 almost doubled, going from 15% to 26%. So when you calculate the change in average earnings in the middle quintile over time, you're including more and more people whose earnings are stagnant, not because the economy's lousy, because they're retired or working very little. What we're measuring might be due to the changing composition of the middle class rather than the impact of the economy. To see if this is important, Winship looks at CBO data on middle quintile households who have children under the age of 18, not too many elderly households there, and non-elderly households without children. And what does Winship find when you look at labor income and exclude most of the elderly? Pretty steady growth. Very different picture compared to Bernstein's or Krugman's. So who's right? What's the answer? How has the middle class, or the average American, been doing over the last 30 or 40 years? You tell me. You want to get depressed about the state of the American economy and feel justified that we need to do something about it? I've got just the picture for you. You want to feel optimistic and think we should leave things alone? I've got that too. I'm reminded of the old joke where the client asks, how much is two plus two? And the consultant says, how much do you want it to be? But what's the right number? Where's the truth? The truth, it turns out, is complicated. For starters, while a 23% improvement is a lot better than a 7% decrease, 23% over three decades is pretty mediocre. That's not stagnation, but it's nothing to celebrate. And there are a lot of things in the economy that need changing. But having said that, I'm also pretty sure that even the most cheerful numbers understate how the middle class has been doing since the 1970s to see why we have to dig a little deeper. <laughs>